We are moms who are pouring ourselves into our children every hour of every day. We are grandmothers who are also playing the role of primary caretaker. We are moms who are waiting to have children and trying our best to see the struggle through the eyes of God. We are moms who are learning the challenges of a blended family. We are moms in the workplace who are trying our best to balance competing expectations and demands. We are moms with adult children who are leaving our homes to pursue their own dreams. For packing lunches late at night, for cleaning out their backpacks and filling them again, for offering gentle guidance to your own grown children, for becoming taxi drivers and appointment schedulers, for making sure the right baby doll is in their arms before they go to sleep, for helping them pay back their student loans, for cleaning and sterilizing and cooking, for doing their laundry and his laundry and our laundry, for praying and loving and forgiving and falling down and rising to your feet again. For the mom who is overworked and exhausted, for the mom who seems to spend a million hours on a million little things, for the mom who pours Jesus into her family as best she can, and God himself not only celebrates what you do, but rejoices over the uniqueness of who you are. You are seen and you are loved without limits. Welcome to Mother's Day. Hallelujah. Amen. Felicia, talk to us a little bit.
God, this world, we need you, God. body of Christ Church. Good morning to all of you that are watching and participating in this virtual worship experience. We welcome you this morning. If, you, if this is your first time, you are our special guest today, and we certainly hope you won't be disappointed and that you'll come back and worship with us again next Sunday at this same time. And so again, thank you so much. I want to just pause and say a special thank you to all of the mothers, all of the mothers, let's give them a great big hand. Where would we be without our mothers? Because we would not be here and would not exist without our mothers. And so a special thanks to all of our mothers and not only to mothers, but also to uh, all of those women uh, who are mother figures in the world. God bless you, all the big mamas out there, grandmothers. <laughs> You're always mothering, uh, even the children's children. And so a special thank you to all of you at the end of this service and at the end of this sermon, we've got a special tribute for you. And we certainly hope that you will be blessed. I pray that you've been blessed and you have been a participant as well 
in our worship experience this morning in song. I want to thank Reverend Delbert Watkins, Pastor Watkins, for just blessing us as well as this music ministry here the Body of Christ Church that's already always ready and able and uh, just doing a fantastic job in leading us in worship before the throne of God. And so again, thank all of you for your participation. Listen, we are yet in the midst of uh, what seems like a crazy time in the midst of COVID-19. And I'm gonna say it again, this didn't catch God by surprise. God knows and he understands and God has absolute control over everything. And wherever you are right now, I want you to have that assurance today. And I pray that God will give you that absolute assurance from his word. This morning, we're going to the word of God in this preached word. And I don't have a special Mother's Day sermon in particular, but I do have a passage that have a special mother in it that I want to emphasize her love for her child. And so again, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15. And I want to begin reading at verse 21 to the top of verse 23. Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried to him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. And Matthew would have us to see the response of Jesus at this woman's cry and requests, but he answered her not a word. Let me read that again. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed, but Jesus answered her not a word. Let us pray. Our Father, our God, the Creator, Sovereign Lord, King, Majestic Savior. God, we come to you this morning that you might breathe into us life like you did with Adam in the garden. Breathe into us, O oh Father, your freshness. Breathe into us, O oh Father, wisdom. Breathe into us salvation breathe into us purpose breathe into us repentance breathe into us a strong desire that we might long for you even in the midst of your silence in jesus name amen and amen and he said not a word and he said, not a word. I want to talk about the silence of God in desperate times. The silence of God in desperate times. There are too many things more annoying to me than calling somebody on the phone and they don't answer. <laughs> I know no doubt that's happened to you before. It's not only calling them on the phone and they don't answer, but it's calling them, especially when you know that they're holding the phone right there in their hand. And especially when you're in a desperate situation and you need to talk to them. And especially when you keep on calling them and they're looking right there at the caller ID and see your name pop up and yet they still don't answer. It is expected, it even, it's even common courtesy that when someone calls, especially in a time of need, especially repeatedly, that the person on the other end would respond and answer our call. Yet at the same token, my brothers and sisters, I submit to you that what is even more frustrating is when you call on God and he does not answer. 
And I don't know about you, but that bothers me sometimes. <laughs> After all, it's God who even tells us in his word, as well as the psalmist, that when we call upon him, he will answer. The prophet Jeremiah penned these words in Jeremiah 33 and 3. God says, call to me and I will answer you. Now, was he just talking to Jeremiah? Well, in Psalm 38, 15, the psalmist says, for I hope in you, O Lord, you will answer, O Lord, my God. What about Psalms 86 and 7? In the day of my trouble, the psalmist says, I shall call upon you for you will answer me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. God promises to answer when we call, when we petition him, ask, seek and knock and the door will be open. But how many of you have been in situations where when you called upon the Lord and you prayed, you made petition and supplication out of earnestness and there was no response and there was no answer from heaven. Matthew, the penman here in this gospel, he's an eyewitness to this account as he travels with Jesus and the rest of the disciples. And being that disciple of Christ, he states that Jesus and his disciples, they entered the region of Tyre Sidon. When we look at this text, we understand that this woman from that region, she's in a desperate situation. She says unto Jesus that, and makes her petition that her daughter is severely demon possessed. When we look at the Greek term for that is keiko diamonos. Keiko diamonos means that she is ill or bewitched. She is demon possessed. What could be more calamitous and more catastrophic than to have a child that is gravely ill and even more so a child that is demon possessed? Note that even though this mother, mother's daughter, her child was vexed with a demon, here's what I want you to know on this Mother's Day, she still loved her child. <laughs> She never gave up on her child, even yet she interceded for on behalf of her child. She went to bat for her child. She fought by faith for her child's deliverance in Christ. Church, this is a picture of a mother's love. This is genuine love. She didn't abandon or alienate herself from her daughter in her daughter's time of need, even though Listen carefully, because I know sometimes y'all say this to your kids. Even though she knew genuinely that she had a devil on the inside. It was her daughter's affliction. The reality is in this family crisis that drove this mother to Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it again. It was because of her daughter's affliction that drove her to Jesus Christ. It was through distress, it was through trouble that she came crying to the Lord. God has a way in calamity. God has a way in our trouble and in our affliction in driving us to him when we wouldn't normally come under the pleasantries of the sky, but God drove her to himself. And yet when she got there, he said not a word. Matthew, Matthew even states that in her desperation, no doubt standing afar off from Christ, for the reality is she is a pagan in Jewish eyes. She cried out to Jesus. She's a Canaanite woman. She's considered a heathen, unclean, but at the same token, she realized that. But yet she cried out in her desperation to God. Listen to this mother's anxious, frantic, and sincere request to Jesus Christ in verse 22. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Let's start with the back half of her statement. First of all, she may have come from pagan background, but somewhere and somehow she got her hands on a copy of the, the, the Baptist Inquirer Sunday School Journal. When somebody sat it down because they were no longer reading it, and she recognized and read somewhere that Jesus 
is the son of David and that he is Lord. He is the son of David. She understood his lineage. And not only that, the same Jesus of Nazareth she recognized to be Lord. Yet secondly, this woman knew that she was unworthy to be in the presence of Jesus Christ and that she was incapable of requesting anything from him because of her spiritual condition. She recognized that. And so she asked for this one thing, realizing her spiritual state and that ultimately God owed her nothing. She asked for this one thing in the midst of her request for her child's deliverance. Have mercy on me. I can't claim anything. I can't plead anything. Will you just have mercy on me? Will you give me that which I do not rightly deserve? Man, this heathen woman has more spirituality and faith than most of us as Christians. And yet we see here she asks Jesus for mercy. And yet Matthew records intentionally these words that Jesus remained in silent and he answered her not a word. This woman could have been thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this the man of compassion that I've been hearing about? Is this the same Jesus that vi visit widows and the poor? Is this the same Jesus that associates with tax collectors and lepers and sinners? No doubt for some of us or, or, or some of the reasons why she came to Jesus in the first place is because she already heard great things about him. No doubt she already had heard about him unstopping the deaf ears. She had no doubt heard about Jesus opening up blind eyes and causing the lame to walk. No doubt she had already heard, even being from Cana, that he healed lepers of their disease. No doubt she had even heard about Jesus casting a demon out of a, a lunatic in a cemetery. No doubt she had even heard that this is the same Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead. But church, I submit to you, but what she probably did not hear is that this is the same Jesus that when Mary and Martha, the sisters of Jesus, bequested, or Lazarus bequested Jesus to come to heal their sick brother. Instead of rushing to come and heal him, Jesus intentionally sat down and waited two more days after their urgent plea and after their urgent request intentionally allowing Lazarus to die and then turn around and told his own disciples it was good for you that I did not go when I was summoned so that Lazarus would die. What this woman did not know she understood and heard no doubt about the resurrection of Lazarus but she did not know that Mary and Martha had to wait in three days of silence after their prayer requests came before Jesus and he showed up. She no doubt heard the tragic story of Job and his loss, but yet she did not hear about the 37 chapters of Job's silence before God, where God did not speak to Job for 37 chapters. She missed the words of Job, no doubt in Job 30 and verse 20, when Job said unto God, I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. Even when I stand up, you merely just stare or you look at me. I'm crying out, but you're not responding. Even when I stand up to get your attention, you ignore me. She missed that, she, she missed that. She went right to chapter 42 and heard how God had blessed Job and, and had increased everything he lost two times over what he had in the beginning. <laughs> in the words of Jewish Yale professor Edward Greenstein, he states that Job filed a lawsuit against God. <laughs> I love this. Greenstein states that Job knew the legal system of his day and that 
he'd have to have at least one or two witnesses if he's going to file this lawsuit and not having any witnesses uh, in his case against God then and lacking a witness he became the exculpatory uh, oath he took an exculpatory oath himself he was his lone witness and he had to prove his own innocence before God so in doing so Greenstein says that that God had, he had to provide evidence to God of his innocent or make God prove his guilt. Greenstein says, finally, God responds. He finally answers on the 30 in the 38th chapter, but he answers in legal terms and he throws Job's case out of the courtroom on a technicality. Because in his oath, Job claimed that he knew everything about God. And he knew how everything worked in the universe. So God reprimands him, reprimands him. In chapter 38, Job finally comes to silence himself because God, the righteous judge, silenced him. And God finally speaks 38 chapters later. But when he speaks, he asks Job 30, uh, 66 questions. And it begins with this. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. And God says to Job, I will question you and you shall answer me. And God asked Job, where was Job uh, when I laid the foundation of the earth? That's the first question. That's a hard question to ask. So Job is so wise, God says, then he must be able to uh, uh, make note that he was there in creation to know how God created everything. Job has no reply. By suing God, <laughs> Greenstein says, Job finally gets an answer from God, a response from God. God finally speaks, but it ain't the answer that Job is looking for. How often we feel the same way that Job feels. We think the same thoughts that Job have in our time of desperation. If I could only come before the presence of God, if I could just have a little talk with Jesus, <laughs> I'd ask him a few questions. I'd ask him, what are you doing? And do you know what you're doing? And why are you doing this? American novelist, Harvard and Oxford graduate, Christopher Morley said, and I quote, I had a million questions to ask God, but when I met him, they all fled my mind and it didn't seem to matter anyway. <laughs> we always think that if I could just come in the presence of God, I would ask him, what are you doing? Do you know what you're doing and why are you doing this? I need answers, God. I need you to speak. But like Marley, no doubt we would come and just being in the presence of God, overwhelmed by his presence, his majesty, his beauty, his power, his glory. We forget everything that we were going to ask because he is the answer to every question that we might have. Let me say that again. He is the answer to every question in life that we might have. When we go back and look at this Canaanite woman in Matthew chapter 15, this mother is pleading for her daughter's deliverance. She's heard about the wonderful miracles and compassion of God, but I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm sure she didn't know until then that sometimes when you call on God, he doesn't answer a word. But maybe what she didn't know is that she's not alone in this matter. There's been many others before her, and we know even after her, even in the midst of COVID-19, that have called on God in a desperate time, and he doesn't say a word. There is the silence of God. The psalmist in Psalms 22 said, my God, I cry out by day, but you have not answered by night, but I find no rest. <laughs> Even Jesus, the son of God at Calvary, the Bible says that there were three hours of darkness, three hours where God, where Jesus sat in darkness in the silence of God. And he finally cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've all experienced that feeling of isolation, even abandonment from God in his silence. 
God, what are you doing and why and why now? But seeming to draw away this desired mercy from this woman, Jesus drew her uh, on uh, on her uh, request and on her plea so much so that his goal was to draw the woman unto himself. Oftentimes when God responds with absolute silence, what he does is create a desire that we will long for him even more. God says, hey, wait a minute, I'm not going to respond, I'm not going to answer. It makes us stop and ask the question, why is water so much refreshing? when we're really thirsty. God creates that thirst. It asks us, makes the question, it asks uh, uh, ask us, uh, it makes us ask, ask the question and answer the question, why does uh, adversity and, and deprivation and insufficiency and even suffering produce the best qualities in life? And the paradox of that is on the other hand, comfort and prosperity and abundance it often produces the worst in us. My brothers and sisters, don't you see it? There's a pattern in God's design and deficiency because deficiency by God's design, it creates desire. And that desire, when there is absence, it intensifies the desire. And the more intensified the desire, the greater the satisfaction will be when it is met. God creates thirst. God creates hunger oftentimes by not responding, by not answering. So the Canaanite woman in her desperation, she cries out. She makes her request known to Christ. And he just sits there in silence. And he does not, Matthew says, answer her word. Again, God was increasing her thirst. God was intensifying her desire. God, Jesus wanted her to know that he wasn't just Jesus, but he's Jesus Christ. He's not just deliverer, but he is Lord. He's not just healer, but he is master and savior. My brother and sister, if God has not responded to your requests, God is not, you feel so heard your prayer, and answered and spoken on your behalf. I want you to know this, he hears, but it is in his silence that he creates a deep desire that we've never had and a craving and a longing for him that we would grope after him. And after groping, though he be not far away, God finally answers with himself. He quenches our every thirst and satisfies I ever hung, uh, 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 I ever, uh, even all of our hungers. The silence of God, my church and my brothers and sisters, I want you to know it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Wherever you are, say the silence of God. It's a good thing. But why is it that we always expect God to speak uh, all the time and give us answers for everything that we're looking for. Why is it that we expect God to speak every time we pray and we make petition to him? I know what the word of God says, that when you call upon me, I will answer. But maybe God is speaking, we're just not listening. <laughs> Sometimes uh, when God is speaking, we're too busy to hear the words of Christ. You know, when we talk about God speaking, it seems like uh, there is a segment in the body of Christ or in the church in general, universal. And they're a whole lot more spiritual than I am. When you talk to preachers today and pastors and church folk in general and the prophets, they always use language like God is speaking to me. I was sitting there the other day and God spoke to me and I heard him so clearly and to be honest with you it sounds real biblical it sounds real spiritual but the question is is it real biblical <laughs> it's not is it real spiritual but is it real biblical and to be honest with you we love uh, uh sitting under someone who constantly says that god just spoke to me and god just told me to tell you even in the midst of COVID 19 people have been saying god is speaking in the midst of all of this I've had people even ask me, Pastor, what do you hear God saying in the midst of COVID-19? 
Can I be honest with you? Can I be transparent? Can I be real open with you? I don't know what God is saying. And the reason why I don't know what God is saying is because I have not heard God speak to me in this mess. I think maybe one of the best things to do is ask all the faith healers, ask them the question. They're the one, the self-proclaimed prophets of our day that are going around and they're on television before COVID-19 with a word from the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about those who are preaching from the written text, from the Bible, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No, I'm talking about the super spiritual folk that are proclaiming that they get power over sickness, they get power over death, that they get power over disease disease. They've got power over storms until a storm comes and then we don't see them standing in the midst of tornadoes and hurricanes. They claim to have power over Satan and power over demons and power over every spirit. But where are they in the midst of coronavirus? In the U.S. alone, we've got over 1.4 million confirmed cases in the U.S. alone. That's nearly, as I checked yesterday, 79,000 deaths as a result of COVID-19 in the United States alone. And I asked the question again, where are all the prophets? Where are all the faith healers? Where are all the spiritual people that's got a word from the Lord and they have power over the devil and over disease? Globally, outside of the United States, but including the United States, we've got 4 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and over 275,000 deaths globally. Where are all these people? Where are all these people? Again, they say they've got power on the good days. They've got power over sickness and disease and death and over the devil and over demons. Oh, that's all right. That's right. They have to be in church to exercise that power. They have to be on a platform to exercise that power. They got to be before people who will give them money to exercise that power so that they can collect 10 hours, 10 offerings in that service so you can get your deliverance and you can pay for your healing. Why are they not going to the hospitals now? Why are they not waving their hands over the sick and the crowd convalescent in nursing homes? Oh, yeah, that's right, because they need their televisions following them and their crew and their armor bearers in order to get into the hospitals and into the nursing homes. Of course, you can call the prophetess. She used to be uh, popular a few years ago. And. And uh, she, one moment she was wrapped up in sheets and the next moment she was, said she had no more sheets. The next thing I know, I turned the television on last year and she was selling anointed sheets. And now she's selling a $133 prayer kit in the midst of COVID-19 when prayer is free. When are we going to wake up that you don't have to spend $133 and give it to anybody in order to be heard from God? Where is the prophet, the master prophet out of New York? Where is the charlatan prophet out of Charlotte, North Carolina, who tested positive for faith when we need them in the midst of COVID-19? Where are all the self-proclaimed prophets across the continent of Africa? Where are all these people and why are they not going to the funeral homes and raising the dead like they always claim when they're on foreign soil and they spoke and somebody came to life where we don't have any witnesses of that over here. I'm not doubting or questioning the power of God, but what I am is questioning and what I am is putting my, doing is putting my finger on the inconsistency and the heresy of these people that call themselves prophets, they call themselves miracle workers, and when we need them most, there's no answer from them. Not unless you're gonna pay to get an answer. And yet we got people who, and I say this respectfully, where there's bodies stacked up in places like New York, I'm gonna say it again, in the US alone, we've got over 80,000 people who have died, 80,000 people. You got so much power to raise the dead. I'm sure that they left 80,000 families behind to mourn their deaths. Where are you now? So let me be honest with you. I don't know, I haven't heard the voice of God. I, I don't know, I ain't that spiritual. You got to ask the spiritual folk, what is God saying? But church, I've come to this conclusion. It's okay to say that I don't know. 
It's okay to say that I haven't heard a specific revelation from God specifically to me about what he's doing and what's going out on outside of the Bible itself. It's okay, church, just relax. It's okay to say, like this woman, I haven't heard the voice of God. And you can still be spiritual in saying it. Let's just back up for a moment. If God the Father didn't speak to his own son on the cross, if God didn't speak to his servant David while he was in the cave crying out to him, if God didn't speak to Paul and answer him when he made petition on three different occasions for God to respond, if God didn't speak to John to bat the Baptist while he was waiting on execution in Herod's jail cell, if, if, and then if Jesus didn't respond when he heard this woman's request and she was okay with it, then why can't we be okay with God saying absolutely nothing? Years ago, I read writing of Oswald Chambers that made an impression upon me. Chambers asked the question, it's a pointed question. He says, can God trust you with his silence? <laughs> can God trust you with his silence? It's almost like a parent going out of the room there. You don't sense their presence, but chances are they're somewhere near. But can God trust you in that moment when you feel like he's not around? Chambers goes on to say in thought, and if I can give you a summation, he says when, when you can't hear God, you, you find that really God is trusting you with his silence in a most intimate way possible. In the midst of absolute silence, because silence, he says, is not despair, but it's one of pleasure because God saw, listen to this, Chambers says, God saw that you could withstand the silence and wait for a bigger revelation. <laughs> Can God trust you with his silence? Are you still going to be faithful? Are you still going to be persistent like this woman in the text? Or are you going to let go of God's unchanging hands? You know, church, what I've realized over the years, God does his best work in silence. <laughs> God does his best work in the midst of silence. We already said that God creates an even greater desire, a thirst, a hunger in the midst of silence. But also remember also <clears throat> that this is what I want you to remember, that when God is silent, he is always active. Even though God is silent, he is always active in our lives. John Piper said that in, in the course of a day, God might be doing 10,000 things in our lives and we only recognize one, two, or three of them out of the 10,000. God is always active even when we don't hear his voice or sense his presence. God is always fulfilling his purpose in our lives. We use an adage that silence is golden, it really is. I was reminiscing the other week, First uh, Kings chapter 6 and verse 7, when the construction workers in Israel were erecting Solomon's temple. The text says in First Kings 6 and 7 something that I, made, I had to take note of that we normally would read right over because it seems insignificant. First Kings 6 and 7, the text says, in the temple when it was being built was built with stone, finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. There's something there I don't want you to miss, church. In other words, when the temple was being built, it was being built with stone that was finished. It was chiseled away and made to fit in a certain slot on the wall at the quarry. So when they got up to the temple building and to the site, there was no hammering, there was no chiseling, there was no iron tool because the workers realized that what they wanted to give to God, the highest tribute they could give to God is their silence. And God built the temple in the midst of silence. That's what God impressed upon me. He still does his best work. In the midst of silence, when he's silent and we get silent before him, God still 
builds the temple. And oh, what a beautiful abiding temple. Although Jesus didn't say a word to this mother, he didn't immediately respond to her request, but he was already active in her life, already active. You might, have, might not have seen his hands or his feet move, and he may not even look her way, but he was already actively involved in working, fulfilling his purpose in her life. I'm reminded of another story in the gospel, recorded in the gospel, where there's a man, a leader from Capernaum. You may remember the story where he came to Jesus and he begged Jesus to come to his house, listen to that, to come to his house and to heal his son who was on his deathbed. And this is what I noticed in the text. Jesus actually refused to go to the man's house, but Jesus was still active in the place where he was standing. Jesus just told the man, you go home. You never heard Jesus pray. He just says, you go home. In the, man, in the man's ears and eyes, although Jesus says, go home, your son is fine. But when he left the house, he understood, no, my son is not fine. He's on his deathbed. But he turned it out of obedience and started heading back home. And when he got halfway, he met his servants. And the servants brought him the good news. He said, the boy was all right. He's doing just fine. He's healed. And the father asked the servants, you know, what time did this happen? He said, yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him. And the man thought about it and said, that's the exact same time when Jesus told me to just go home. <laughs> he didn't go to my house. He didn't come to my house, but he was still active. He didn't, I didn't hear him answer my prayer or my request or my questions, but he's still active in my life and he's still present. Here's something else, church, I've noticed about the silence of God. God's silence is oftentimes a test in our life. It's a test. Somebody say test. God's silence is always a test in my life. Over the years, I've reminisced on how teachers test students, <laughs> whether they are children or whether they are adults. When teachers are administering tests, they don't talk. They give you the instruction. They flip the test uh, the questions uh, over on your desk uh, face down and you take out your pencil and they say from now on for the next hour however long this test is supposed to last there is no talking you don't ask any questions the teacher is not responding there's no lessons being given and here's one of the reasons why there's no talking from the teacher nor from the students it's because the silence gives the, the students and sets an atmosphere where the students can reflect on what the teacher has been saying and what he, has been, he or she has been teaching up to that point and where they're being tested. In other words, when you don't hear from God, oftentimes he's saying, I've already said enough <laughs> in the days before. There was sermon after Sunday after sermon. There was Bible study after Bible study, devotional after devotional. When you were riding along in the car, I was speaking to you. Now it is time for a test. And the really reason why I'm silent is so that you can reflect on what I've said in the days pre prior in the midst of your test. But here's a problem. If we're not studious students, and we're not disciples that are following Jesus Christ closely when it comes to that time of testing, and when the teacher, the master teacher is not speaking to us, we get bewildered and we're overwhelmed and we're anxious. It's because you gotta understand that in time of testing, it is not a time of teaching. It is a time of reflecting. Here's another thing that I want you to remember in the midst of God's silence. When you're seeking answers from God and there seems to be no response. I want you to know this. Jesus sees, Jesus knows, and Jesus cares. Jesus sees, Jesus knows, and Jesus cares. I'm going to say it one more time. Jesus sees, he knows, and Jesus cares. Psalms 31 and verse 7 is a wonderful reference where we can capture all three of that, those things. Jesus sees, Jesus knows, and, and he cares. The psalmist says in Psalms 31, 7, I will be glad and rejoice in your love, in your love. For you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. 
You, I, I will gladly rejoice in your love. And at the same token, the psalmist says, and you saw my affliction and you knew the anguish of my soul. Let's break that down just for a moment before we close out. Church, I want you to know that God sees everything. God is omniscient. And that's a part of his attribute or his characteristics. It's part of who he is. He is omniscient. He sees all things. There is nothing ever hidden from the Lord. The phrase that God seeth in the Hebrew, it, it actually means the, uh, the Hebrew name El Roha, which means the God who sees. Ask Hagar when she was in the wilderness, if you will, and didn't know which way to go. She realized that El Roha was with her and that he sees everything. But he not only sees, but the psalmist says, and God knows. That's a still a part of his omniscient. God is all knowing, not only seeing, but he understands all things. He is omniscient. There's nothing that not only God does not see, but there's nothing that God is not aware of. You see, you got to understand this about the existence of God. God exists outside of time. Therefore, God's knowledge is timeless. It is not bound in the bubble of time. In other words, there is nothing that God is not aware of because he is timeless, meaning this, that he knows the past, the present, and the future all at the same time because he's not bound by time. What does that really mean? It's because not only God knows the future, but he is already preparing right now. Listen, uh, whatever you have need of in Christ Jesus because of what he already has seen and he knows about the future, but when was it established? It was established in the past. God's past and his present and his future is really the same because he's not bound by time. That is what makes him all-knowing. Not only that, but the psalmist says God cares. The word care could be substituted with the word love because the psalmist again says, he says that I will basically bask in his love. I will take comfort in his love. He understood how much God loved him. I will be glad and rejoice in your love or in your care. <laughs> Jesus asked the question in Matthew chapter 7, verse 9. He says, what man is there among you in, in, on the earth, actually, if his son asked for bread and he would give him a stone? Or if the son asked for a fish, he would give him a poisonous serpent? If you then being evil as human beings, and we're all evil or tainted by sin, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. He asked this question, how much more, how much more will your father and who is in heaven give you those things, those things that you ask of him? God sees, God knows, God cares because he's a loving God and he will provide for us what we need even though even though we may not hear him, he is present and he is active. Let me, let me tell you something. Sometimes when we don't sense the presence of God, we got to understand that it's phenomenological, which means it's all about feelings. It's about emotion and not about facts. God is speaking all the time this priceless gift and oftentimes in, a, in, in, oftentimes in objective words so that we don't have to rely on our subjective feelings and our emotions because our emotions, they fluctuate from circumstance to circumstance from day to day. Oftentimes God is silent and in his silence he wants us to sit down and get quiet and be still with him. Psalms 46 and verse 10, Psalm 46, 10, you know what the psalmist says. He says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes the reason why we don't hear from the Lord, we don't sense his presence, is because we're too busy. We're making way too much noise. It's the one thing I'm grateful for COVID-19 in the midst of this pandemic. I've been able as a pastor to do what uh, a lot of times I know I need to do, but just don't do. And that is just to sit and be still <laughs> and to get quiet. Because if he says, be still and know that I am God, then we cannot know that he is God. We cannot know with assurance that he is, a God, that he is God and sense his presence and hear the voice of God 
if we're always busy. Here's another thing, it's a pet peeve of mine, but I want you to take it to heart, and I say this out of love. Don't say God is silent, and God is not speaking when your Bible is closed. <laughs> Oftentimes God is speaking, but we're just not opening up his God-breathed, inspired word. There's more than 750,000 inspired, God-breathed words from cover to cover in that Bible, his book that he's given to us about himself and about life and his relationship with us. If you really want to hear from God, now if you want to tell me, Pastor, what do you hear in the midst of COVID-19 and what has God said to you? No specific revelation. But I can certainly go to the word of God and says, God already said this day was going to happen. God already said there's going to be days like this. God already said that in his word, it is revealed, it is given with clarity that we are living in the last days where there's going to be famines and pestilence and disease, wars and rumors of wars. God's already said in his word, don't be deceived. I can tell you what he said from his word. But don't say God is not speaking or God is trying to say something. You'll never hear it if your Bible is closed. My brothers and sisters, I close with the words of the psalmist from Psalms 62 and 5. Psalms 62 and 5, and the psalmist says, For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my help is from him. When I was a kid, we used to sing in church, and Pastor Watkins we were saying the same thing. It's a song that we grew up with and hearing our mothers sing. And the saints in the church, I come to the garden alone. And you know, I didn't understand that song then. I took it literally as a garden, a flower garden. And that, that song is much deeper than that one. When you get, live to get older and you go through some things in life, that song takes upon a totally different meaning. And so now when I hear the words, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. In church, sometimes it, you feel lonely, life gets bitter there's hurt, there's shame. We feel like we're lost, but when we come to that garden of silence, we know that he walks with me, that's the presence of God, and he talks with me, the voice of God, and then he assures me and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy we share <laughs> is he and I, we tarry there. There's nothing that can compare to it because there's none other has ever known. Oh, you might be walking through that garden right now. Not only has God, you don't sense the presence of God or the voice of God, but you just feel all alone. You feel a sense of despair. Let me tell you, God is the one who invites you to that garden. He chose Peter, James, and John and says, come with me. And he took them to Gethsemane. He says, all you got to do is just sit here and pray. Just sit here and pray. We know three times they fell asleep. Now, while they fell asleep, they miss a great lesson in watching Jesus suffer, but suffer graciously. When he sensed that maybe the, the presence of his father was removed or he was in the absence of the presence of God. And yet it was there that God replenished his strength. It wasn't based on emotion but he was able to get up from that garden, from the tears and perspiration and do what the Father had called and ordained him to do. Church, I want you to know on this day, he still walks with you and he still talks with you. And he's reminding you right now that you are his very own. So much so, not only did he create you, no matter who you might be, but Jesus Christ went to the cross to die for you. If that's not enough, I don't know what is. Let me go ahead and tell you this. Jesus did answer that woman's request. It was because of her persistent faith. It was because she understood that even though he's not responding, he still loves me. He still cares. 
He still hears. He still knows. I just need to wait on him because he's doing something special on the inside. Oh, wait on him, church. Wait on him. Let us pray, Father God. We give you thanks for your word. Thank you, O oh Father, even in desperate times, O oh God. We realize you have not abandoned us. Lord, in the chaos of this world, there may be no doubt some people and some families are giving up on you. Some even question whether or not you exist anyway, oh God. I pray that you would show yourself, Lord, that they will know that you're not only a true God, but you're a living God, a caring and compassionate God. Lord, I, may, I pray today, if there's anyone that may, may not know Christ as their Savior, that today, oh Father, they would open up their hearts and come running to you. And Lord, for you are drawing them, like with this woman, oh Father, from the Canaanite woman, you drew her out of her affliction. You drew her out of her pain, even for her child. But Lord, it's through that pain that you're drawing somebody today, and I pray. Lord, that they will come to Christ as their Lord and Savior and realize that all have sinned, all have sinned. The preacher and everybody come short of your glory. We're all in the same boat and we're separated from you because of original sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden. But Lord, help us to realize that you are a forgiving God, a merciful God, a God of grace that is waiting to pardon us, O oh Father and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So today I pray that they would surrender, open their heart to Christ and accept his finished work on Calvary's cross to do what we cannot do for ourselves, and that is to save us. Lord, and I pray today, oh Father, if there's anybody who know Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that they too, oh Father, would come running back to you if they've strayed away. If they're not where they should be in their relationship with you, and so often we're in that place, I pray today, this becomes a time of repentance, a time of reconciliation. Lord, we pray for mothers everywhere that your hands would be upon them, that you would protect them, that you would guide them, that you would strengthen them, oh God. Continue to give them wisdom and help them to realize that they are loved. Help us as husbands and help us as fathers and help us even as children, to be more appreciative of the mothers that you have blessed us with. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen and amen. God bless you and thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I certainly hope you have been blessed and I certainly hope <laughs> that you will spread this gospel message to others. Share it, like it. Make sure you subscribe. Hit that subscribe button if you're watching us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook so that way you can get the alerts uh, whenever we're putting something out there or whenever we're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much again even for your giving and thank you for those at Body of Christ Church who have been so faithful in your giving uh, to help sustain this ministry in a time of crisis and uh, we're able to continue on in ministry and be a blessing to others not only locally but across the world in our missions efforts so god bless you and thank you so much listen this will soon be over i don't know if it's going to be next week i don't know if it's going to be next year but it will be over eventually but i want you to put your trust in god sooner or later we'll physically be back together again and hopefully this time we will appreciate what god has given us Hopefully this time we won't come to church 30 minutes late. <laughs> Hopefully this time we will be in the house of the Lord rejoicing, standing on our feet and praising God together. God bless you again. Don't forget your giving. Go to bodyofchristchurch.org, bodyofchristchurch.org. Click that giving button. You can give online or you can mail your checks. Uh, to support, continue to support this ministry. Let's pray for one another. Let's keep in touch with each other. As we close today with some of the folk from our music ministry and a few others that have put together a tribute to mothers, not only their mothers, but to all mothers. God bless you. And once again, happy Mother's Day. Be blessed.